what motivates our paper is the following. In an economy that is growing, the mo this, uh, most uh, successful cohorts actually uh, should be better off than the previous ones. However, recent evidence indicates that while the economy is still growing, some of the recent cohorts are actually worse off. So what we are going to argue that um, it is actually important to be thinking more about changes in lifetime uh, opportunities across cohorts and uh, large group uh, within those cohorts. So let me be more specific about what we are measuring as lifetime opportunities and, and why. So first, we're going to measure wage of men and women and wage as a function of human capital. And why do we think wage is interesting? This paper got uh, Governor uh, Kaplan, so and Wittner, they measure lifetime earnings across cohorts. And uh, they found out that um, for the medium lifetime earnings for men born in the 1960s cohorts is actually 12 to 19% lower than those men born in the 1940s. And uh, the opposite pattern is true for women. So um, men boy, uh, women born in the 1960s birth cohort, the medium lifetime earnings is actually 22 to 33% higher. And uh, well, those findings are really interesting. And uh, the change in lifetime earnings may be coming from changing labor supply, which is what we want to um, actually want to study. Therefore, we're going to measure um, the uh, change in uh, wage, and in particular wage as a function of human capital. And also, as you can see, that uh, the change in men and women actually in the opposite direction. And we want to understand whether the change is affecting uh, married and single people differently, because uh, most people uh, in the economy are actually in couples, and the opposite direction of change may uh, be uh, mitigated. And. Uh, And next, we're going to measure a change in medical expenses um, by using aggregate data. And Hall and Jones show that uh, the ratio of medical expenses over consumption actually has been increased from 9% in 1975 to 15% in the year 2000. Well, those are large changes in the aggregate. We want to see that if how this change in aggregate translate into changing uh, in, uh, across cohorts. And finally, we're going to measure life expectancy, uh, late in life. And an influential paper by Case and Deaton measure um, mortality rates of white and non-college edu educated uh, middle-aged uh, Americans. And they found that mortality of this group actually have been increased by 22%. And again, this is a substantial increase in mortality rates. We want to see how much of the uh, change in mortality rates translate into change in uh, life expectancy. And uh, let me be more specific about what we're doing in this paper. So we're going to focus on white and non-college educated Americans born in the 1940s versus 1960s. And why do we focus on this group of people? And this is the group that Keith and Deating have found to have uh, increased mortality rates. And then we document the new facts about the changing in opportunities that those people are facing in terms of, in terms of wage, medical expenses, and the life expectancy. And then we calibrate a structural model with married and single men and women for the 1940-1960 cohorts. And then we ask, what if we give those group of people the wage schedule, medical expenses, and life expectancy of the 1940 cohorts? And how would the labor supply, saving, and welfare would be different under this uh, new uh, lifetime opportunities? So in summary, it's, our paper is about documenting the facts of the changing lifetime opportunity and uh, evaluating the effects uh, of those changes through a, a structural model. And uh, let me give you some key uh, feature about the model. Uh, in the model, there are single and, and people and married people, and we also model marital transitions. And uh, we allow for human capital accumulation. Human capital is modeled as um, past average earnings. And human capital is affecting wage, which we find is very important uh, in the data. And uh, people in this economy uh, face risks uh, during the working age and also during the retirement age. And they can self-insure against those risks through uh, either saving or changing labor supply. 
And we also model specifically uh, government taxes and transfer programs because uh, those programs uh, can provide insurance and they were in place, so they maybe have mitigated some of the changes. And uh, some of the um, more detail about the model, and it's a life cycle model when one period in the model is one year. And uh, during the working stage, which is from age 25 to 65, people are alive for sure, and they face weight shock. If they are single, they may get married. If they are married, they may uh, get a divorce. And both spouses in a couple can choose to whether to work or not and how many hours to work. And then we move to the retirement stage, which is from age 66 to 99. People face health shock, and health status may affect medical expenses. It also may affect, affect uh, this survival probability. And um, I'm not going to go into more detail about the model. Instead, I'm going to talk about the change in lifetime opportunities that we are uh, documenting uh, from the data. First, I will be uh, talking about changing uh, in wage. So this is the estimated uh, wage as a function of, um, of, uh, of age when uh, the left panel are for married people and right panels are for single people. And uh, let's look at uh, the married people first. So the one on the uh, top is the, uh, is the average wage for married men born in the 1940 cohorts. And we see that average, men f uh, average wage for men born in the 1940 cohorts is much higher than the average, oh, sorry, than the uh, wage for um, married women, which is the one on the bottom. And um, so there's a pretty large general wage gap for the 1940 cohorts. However, over time, as we see that on the top, we get a uh, wage for men actually has been dropping by 9%. So this is a substantial drop in given that the economy is actually growing uh, within the uh, 20, 20 years. And then uh, the opposite is happening for married women. You see the wage for the married women actually has been increasing uh, across cohorts. And the pattern for the single, women, uh, single people is actually very similar to the pattern for married people. And both the graph shows that um, the, um, the gender wage gap that has been observed for the 1940 cohorts it's actually being uh, reduced for the 1960 cohorts due to the uh, reduction of wage for, um, for men and increase of wage for women. So um, next, let's look at uh, wage conditional human capital. So here we have the wage function, which is um, which, uh, by age, and uh, the one on the uh, left is for, oh, one on the left is for, for men and the one on the right is for women. So uh, the solid lines are for 1960 cohort, which is the newer, we want it to be more available. And the dashed lines are actually for 1940 cohorts. And uh, let's, uh, so we have five lines for each cohort and each five line, uh, the, the human capital level is being fixed. So let's look at the one on the bottom, which uh, the two bottom lines, which are for the, uh, which are for the, um, people with zero human capital, which means that they have not been worked at all, so they just enter into the labor market at each age. And uh, the one on the, so, so the one, so uh, the 1940 cohorts, the wage is actually higher than 1960 cohorts. So this means that if we have this 1940 cohorts and the 1960 cohorts who are born later, the wage for men is actually uh, $3.50 lower than uh, the people who were born in the 1940s. And then as we actually move along the human capital, we see that the, di the difference is shrinking. So um, the uh, power rate even at the top, which is the uh, people with 99% of human capital. So those are people really with high human capital. We see that um, people who are born in the 1960s, the wage is actually still lower than people who are born in the 1940s. So this is true for, um, for men. And um, if we go to the uh, right panel, we see the wage for women. We see that the pattern is actually switched. So now people who were born in the 1960s, the wage is actually uh, higher than people who were born in the 40s. So it's about 30, uh, 30 cents higher. And uh, if we move down the human capital, we see that uh, 
the comparison is being switched again. So at the bottom of the human capital, we see that uh, married women with zero human capital. And in the 1960s, the wage is about 90 cents lower than people who were born in, in the 1940s. So um, the drop is true for women too. However, the drop is actually uh, lower than the large drop for, for men, both in terms of the absolute value and also in the percentage term. So what we can conclude from this two graph is that there's a large drop in wage, conditional human capital, and uh, the lower is the human capital, the larger is the drop across cohorts. And this is especially uh, true for, for men. And uh, so now let me move on to the measured uh, out-of-pocket medical expenses, which we construct from uh, health and retirement studies. So um, this is only, it only happens in the retirement stage. So uh, we measure out-of-pocket medical expenses from age 66 to age 99. And the graph shows that the uh, medical expenses that face uh, the 1960 cohorts are expecting is going to be 80% uh, higher than those people who were born in 1940s. So again, this is a pretty large substantial increase for those uh, cohorts who were born only uh, 20 years apart. And uh, finally, let's look at uh, life expectancy. And uh, we, construct, we estimate mortality rates from HIS data, and then we construct the life expectancy. And we have uh, two measurements. This is at age 50. And the reason that we calculate life expectancy at age 50 is because this is the age group that uh, case and dating uh, study. And then we also construct life expectancy at age 66 because this is more relevant for our model because in the model we don't allow people to die before age 66 uh, due to uh, computation reason. And uh, so we see that life expectancy at age 50 is, um, for, for men, it's 77.6 uh, uh, for at a, uh, for 1940 cohort, and uh, for women it's higher. It's 79.8 uh, age, and we also see that uh, across cohorts, life expectancy at age 50 uh, has been dropped by uh, 1.5 years for men, and for women the drop is slightly uh, slow. Is this for all men or just for generations? So this. Is, <laughs> and uh, for women, the job is lower, it's about 1.1 years. And uh, the job of life expectancy at age 66 is very similar. It's only slightly larger than the job of life expectancy at age 50. And uh, so what we do next is we're going, we calibrate our model to fit uh, the outcome of the 1960 cohort, and then we do uh, four counterfactuals. And we're going to change either wage function or medical, sorry, medical expenses and uh, life expectancy, and finally we change all of the three together. And then we see how, uh, what is the change of um, labor supply and saving and also welfare. So let me uh, first look at the effect of changing wage schedule on participation. And um, the left panel is for married, uh, married people, and the solid lines are the outcome for the 1960 cohort. And dash lines are the outcome of the people that uh, with 1940 um, which schedule. And uh, so what we, we, what we see is that for married women, the participation has been increased substantially. And for married men, there's a drop of participation. So this is because now uh, married women are facing lower wage opportunities. So as a result, they work less, and uh, the married women actually compensate by working more. And uh, the, uh, we also see the change for singles, and uh, single women actually also are working more, so they're participating more. 
And this is because, um, partly because they were expecting to uh, marry a husband with low uh, wage. Uh, and uh, then let's look at uh, the uh, hours conditional on work. And um, we see the noticeable change is for, um, for married women, when married women actually are working more, and they increase hours by 100 hours uh, a year under this uh, 1960 wage schedule. And uh, now let's look at saving. So due to the negative wealth effect coming from the reduction of wage rate, and um, saving for retirement has been uh, dropped, and it is substantial for single single person, uh, single men, and the drop of uh, this uh, assets at age 66 has been dropped by 21%. And uh, for single women, the change is much smaller. And for couples, the change is also small, it's about 6.1%. So this already uh, highlight it's important to model uh, a couple that has both men and women, therefore uh, when married women are working, working more, they can compensate, so there's less reduction in, in saving. And finally, let's look at the changing welfare. So we want to see how large people are worse off and or better off under the, uh, the new uh, wage schedule. So we're going to measure the uh, welfare as the one-time asset compensation that we need to give people at age 25 so that they are indifferent between uh, the 1960 versus the 1940 wage schedule. So we find out that everybody loses due to the uh, change in the wage schedule. And in particular, the one-time asset compensation that we need to give the single man is about 7.3% of the present discarded lifetime earnings. So that's a pretty big uh, loss. And for couples, the loss is 4.5% of the uh, present lifetime earnings. And for single women, it's 3.4%. Uh, and uh, now let's move on to the change of medical expenses, which has been increased over uh, across cohorts. We find out that saving uh, goes up because now they have to save more to compensate for the uh, expected medic higher medical expenses. And uh, there's a smaller change in participation and hours. And also people are going to uh, lose welfare under the higher medical expenses. And one-time asset compensation for single men is 1.4%, for single women 1%, for couple 0.9%. And uh, then we go, we're going to look at the changing life expectancy. So over cohorts, life expectancy has been shortened. So as a result of that, saving went down because now they have a shorter retirement period. And there's uh, almost no change in participation and hours. And also, uh, since people value life, so they uh, also suffer welfare due to the uh, shortened life expectancy. The one-time asset compensation for single men is 3.2%. For single women, 2.4%, and for couples, 2.2%. And uh, finally, we're going to put all the three changes together, and we see that there's changing participation and hours, mainly for married couple, and this is largely driven by the changing wage schedule. And uh, saving goes up slightly because uh, those different forces are moving saving in different directions. So, uh, however, the increased medical expenses dominates the change of other effects, so we still see increase of, of saving. And uh, all the changes lead to welfare loss, so that adds up to pretty substantial welfare losses. For single men, it's 12.5%. For couples, 8.1%. And for single women, 7.3%. So those are substantial change in welfare. And uh, to conclude, so we have documented that um, people who were born in the 1940, uh, 1960 cohorts among the group of non-college, non-college educated white Americans, they have experienced substantial uh, worsening out uh, lifetime outcomes than those who were born in the 1940s. So they were experienced much lower wage over the lifetime, and they were expected to have much higher medical expenses and shorter life expectancy at retirement uh, stage. So um, all those changes lead to sub substantial welfare loss. And uh, our, our paper indicates that it's important to be thinking more about the changes of, um, of lifetime opportunities experienced by different cohorts and also by education level. And uh, 
for example, those are some uh, uh, interesting policy questions. And we have modeled certain uh, government uh, policies. And to what extent did those uh, government policy attenuated those changes? And uh, should the government have done something differently? Should they introduce new uh, policies? Or should, uh, should they change some of the policies? And if they do, what are the policies? And um, at what stage should this uh, policy be, um, be introduced? <laughs> 